A very warm welcome, uh, especially if it's your first time here. As always, if you, I hope you had a good uh, meditation next door. And uh, great. So today we're going to have a look at this symbol here, which is called the Wheel of Life. Yeah, and it's one of the most well, it's one of the most uh, important and probably helpful symbols in the whole of Buddhism. Yeah. Um, I mean, you could say, in a way, it contains the whole of Buddhism. Yeah. Um, so we can't go into the whole thing, but obviously, because it's enormous, but we'll go into uh, some of it and get a sort of sense of what it could uh, say to us, yeah? So, we'll begin, I thought, like, with a brief overview of the wheel, yeah? Um, then a run-through of the wheel, and then we'll focus on these, don't worry, these six sections here. Uh, and I'll, if you can't see it very well, don't worry, I'll kind of point out what each thing is, and you can have a look at the wheel afterwards. And this actually, this, this wheel is emerging in the entrance hall outside on the red wall here. Yeah? So that'd be great when that's finished. Mm. Before that, most of what I'm going to say is actually from a talk given by Sangha Rachta in 1972, uh, who is the founder of this order and movement. Yeah? And I'll refer to him as Banti. Banti just means teacher. So if I say the word Banti, I'm talking about the the man Sangharachita who founded this particular order, yeah? Um, yeah, so, yeah, before that, just uh, a quick kind of look at what a symbol is, yeah? So, um, in a way, listening to this talk, Banti, he's, he's sort of saying that the nature of a symbol is that it can't actually be defined, yeah? That's the whole point. A symbol speaks for itself, yeah? Uh, he also says a symbol is not a sign, you know, so you could have a sign saying, I don't know, 500 miles to, I forget it, somewhere, yeah? That's a sign, it tells you what it is, whereas a symbol is kind of multidimensional, yeah? It's, it's, it could mean many things uh, at the same time, and they might all be true. They might even be paradoxical, they might even be completely different, and yet communicate the same thing, yeah? So... Banti says, uh, the symbol does not stand for something that could be known in some other way other than through the symbol. Yeah, I'll read that again. The symbol does not stand for something that could be known in some other way other than through the symbol. Yeah, so uh, in a way you have to engage with the symbol on its own terms, I think that's what he's saying. Yeah. Um, yeah. The symbol's uh, something that he also says a symbol uh, makes us aware of something that might be unconscious, yeah? Um, and we can only really get to that uh, murky truth that becomes clearer through the symbol, yeah? So it's another way, uh, symbols are very good ways of understanding things. We normally obviously, uh, what's the word? Uh, privilege our, 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 think, our, our thinking mind, our intellect, yeah? But symbols can kind of communicate something that sometimes we can't get to in another way, yeah? So they talk to the depths. Um, but this symbol, where does this symbol come from? Uh, it's hard to say. This symbol kind of apparently emerged about 200 years after the Buddha. I mean, there are some early texts which say the Buddha gave instructions for how this symbol should be drawn, yeah? And that it should be drawn outside of basically temples, monasteries, these kind of places, yeah? Uh, so you, you find, I mean, this, I think this is a, was well, drawn by Arloka, who's uh, part of this order, but most of the wheels of life you'll find are in Tibet, yeah? Um, and they're found at the entrance of a monastery, yeah? Or the en entrance of a temple. So it's important to say these are not, these images are not to be worshipped or anything. They're not like you put candles there and, oh, yeah? That's the opposite of that. <laughs> they're kind of showing you something else, yeah? Um... So I'll just run through the actual wheel and say what we see, yeah? So just to give us a, a general sense of this image. So right in the beginning, right in the middle rather, you have three animals, yeah? You have a cockerel, a snake, and a pig, yeah? And they're all eating the tail of one another, going in a circle, right in the middle, yeah? So you've got a cockerel, a snake, and a pig. Then you have um, these two other... Uh, these two other segments, yeah? You have a, a, a white segment here and a black segment here. And on this segment, you have uh, sort of beings 
you know, dressed very nicely and they've got these nice robes. And I think they're traditionally said to have like malas, beads and stuff. And they're, they're floating upwards, yeah, they're going upwards. And these lot on the, on the right, on the dark segment, they're naked and sometimes said to be chained to each other. And they're falling downwards and not looking very happy at all, yeah. So that's, that's that. Uh, and then you have uh, these, these six different realms, yeah? So you've got the, the central hub, the animals, then you've got people falling down, going up. And up here you have what's called the god realm, yeah? So the god realm is like said to be a, a, a realm of, of pleasure, delight, uh, peaceful, beautiful palaces. Uh, you just think about something and it appears, yeah? A bit like a sort of celestial Amazon or something, you know, just like, oh. Bing, and there it is, yeah? So that's the God realm. Anything you want, yeah? Next to the God realm, you have like what's called the Titan realm, uh, the demigods, or Asherahs as they're called, yeah? They're like warlike creatures, yeah? So sometimes depicted uh, as kind of rough looking dudes, but sometimes you get, uh, you get super muscly warrior type dudes and then super sexy kind of females. So it's like hyper masculine and hyper feminine something like this yeah so the real polarity um that's them uh then you have the uh what are they called the praetor realm so these are the hungry ghosts yeah they've they've got huge bellies yeah very long thin necks enormous eyes yeah and tiny like pinhole mouths yeah and uh they're desperately trying to cram food into their mouth which is very difficult and any food they do get in uh, turns into excrement or fire, liquid fire. Yeah, so that's, that's them. <laughs> Shouldn't ask. Uh, the hell world is underneath that. Uh, basically, the hell world is beings in extreme pain and suffering. Yeah, so that's just like a, a realm of just absolute suffering. Yeah. Uh, the animal realm, well, it says what it is. It's the animal realm. It's a realm where realm of sort of food, sex, sleep, moment to moment existence, trying not to be eaten, yeah, or probably trying to eat something else. And then uh, number six, you have the, the, up here you have the human realm, yeah? So the realm of uh, buying, selling, um, or meditating some of them are, people uh, being born, dying, yeah, the human, human existence, yeah? So that's the six realms. And in each realm, there's a different Buddha, yeah, interestingly. So in each realm, there's a different Buddha. In the God realm, there's uh, like this a snow white colored Buddha playing a vena or a lute, yeah. And uh, this Buddha is playing uh, a melody, yeah. So he's not using concepts in the God realm, he's playing a melody, and it's the melody of impermanence, yeah. Um, yeah, the melody of nothing lasts, yeah. In the Titan realm, you have a green Buddha with a sword, yeah, and he's carrying the sword of wisdom, yeah, the transcendental sword of wisdom. So they're all carrying other swords uh, to, I don't know, conquer each other, and he's carrying the sword of wisdom. In the Praetor realm, in the hungry ghosts, you know, where they're trying to eat, uh, eat some food, uh, this Buddha is a, is a red colored Buddha, like ruby red, apparently, and um, gives them food, showers them food and drink they can actually eat. Yeah, they can actually consume this food. Underneath you have the hell realm. Uh, in the hell realm, again, uh, this segment, you have a smoke-colored Buddha, yeah? And this smoke-colored Buddha offers them amrita, which is a kind of nectar, like a, a celestial nectar of sorts, yeah? In the animal realm, there's a blue-colored Buddha, and he's showing them a book, yeah? I always think it's a bit unfair because animals can't read, but anyway, he's showing, he's showing them a book, yeah? So, uh, yeah. And in the human realm, you have um, a Buddha, much like this, uh, with saffron robes and a begging bowl and a staff, yeah? So that's the... Yeah, and they're the twin, twin symbols of the spiritual life in ancient India, yeah? So that's the six realms. Mm. And we'll have a look at what each of these Buddhas represent in a minute, yeah? Um, but you could say the introduction of each of these Buddhas represents uh, this notion of um, great or absolute compassion, yeah? Regardless of what realm a being, in it, being is, there's, 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 there's the introduction of compassion and a kind of, uh, well, there's an introduction of a Buddha, yeah? 
So we'll go back to that in a minute and look at and we'll probably spend a bit, we'll just spend a bit of time actually on the six realms because they're really interesting. I found them super interesting. But before that, just to give us a complete picture, we've got what are called the 12 links of conditioned existence or the 12 nidanas, yeah? And like I was saying before, this whole thing is a symbol, yeah? But this section here is, yeah, of course, it's also symbolic, but it's actually a representation of a, a teaching, like a highly complex teaching, um, which we don't have time to go into today. Um, but it's kind of, it kind of shows you why, why beings are born at all, or end up at all, why we're here, and how we keep reproducing ourselves, uh, or keep coming into existence. Yeah? So at the top, you have a blind man with a stick, then you have uh, underneath a potter making a pot, yeah? And you have a monkey in a, in a kind of flowering fruit tree. You have a boat with four passengers, one steering. Underneath that, you have a house with uh, five windows and a door. Underneath that, you have a man and a woman embracing. I don't know, maybe they're having sex, maybe having a cuddle, I can't tell here. But um, next to that, you have a guy with an arrow in his eye. Then you have uh, a guy sitting down with a woman offering him a drink. Then you have somebody uh, gathering fruit. Then you have a pregnant woman, woman in childbirth, and a man carrying a corpse to a cemetery. And I'm not gonna explain what any of that means. <laughs> so we're not looking at that today. Um, but gripping this whole wheel is this enormous, terrifying looking monster, yeah? So uh, this monster is uh, sometimes called the demon of impermanence, yeah? And uh, he's got a third eye, and he's got five skulls, yeah? And uh, importantly, outside of this wheel, there's a Buddha on the top right here. There's a Buddha outside the wheel, and he's pointing, and he's pointing to, that's meant to be a moon, yeah? It's meant to be a moon with a hare, a rabbit in it, yeah? And it's a bit of a long story, but this, this symbol, the, the, the rabbit in the moon, represents uh, the Bodhisattva. Yeah? And the Bodhisattva is um, a being that is dedicated to enlightenment, but also enlightenment for, for all. Yeah? It's the kind of great compassion. Yeah? So, um, I mean, Banti then he says at this point, what does it all mean? Yeah? And he says, you can't really say what it means because it's a symbol. Yeah? That's the whole point. <laughs> Uh, you get to its real meaning by stepping inside it. But then he does say, uh, he has a really wonderful way of looking at it again, which is to look at it as a mirror. Yeah? He says, in fact, it's not, it's not a picture or a wheel at all. Yeah? It's something completely different. The wheel of life is actually a mirror. Yeah? And when we look in the mirror, in this mirror, what do we see? We see ourselves. <laughs> so um, he says, in a way, there, there are four mirrors, yeah? There are one, two, three, four. There are four mirrors. And each one is bigger than the last mirror, yeah? Or you could say we look into the mirror four times, yeah? Um, it's a magic mirror. Hmm? Yeah. So he says the first time we look into the mirror uh, requires a bit of courage, yeah? Um, so we, have, we need some courage uh, to look at ourselves, some honesty, yeah? So he says, what do we see when we look into the mirror? He says, we see an animal, yeah, uh, three animals. And he says, the usual explanation for this, which we use all the time here, is they represent three different aspects of us that need to be transformed, yeah? They represent, the cockerel represents craving, the snake represents hatred. No, that's, a, yeah, my, my brain, hold on. The pig represents ignorance, the cockerel's craving, and the snake's hatred, good. We got there. But he says that kind of lets us off the hook a bit lightly, yeah? It's kind of, he says in a way, which I quite like, he said it's a sort of defensive rationalization against the image itself. We say, oh yes, this represents craving over there, hatred over there. He says, no, you look in the mirror and the first thing you see is like a bird, the face of a bird or a snake or a pig. I thought, oh, that was fantastic. Mm -hmm. So and I thought, yeah, it's kind of true. I was thinking like the way I eat sometimes, it is like a dog or a wolf. I'm sort of, blah, 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 blah. Or, you know, you find yourself in different kind of animalistic modes. We won't go into that. There's lots you could say about that in Berlin. But <laughs> so, actually, I remember we drove past, what was it, Kit Kat Club? And there was like, everyone was, everyone was dressed in, in like bondage gear and like this rubber. We were on your scooter. 
and there was one dude dressed as a zebra, <laughs> like a fluffy zebra. And I thought, this guy, he looks, he's, the, he's the dangerous one. <laughs> so anyway, there's all sorts of stuff going on, yeah. Um, yeah, so we see an animal, yeah? Um, where am I? That's right. Yeah, and in a way, uh, it's kind of super important, yeah, that we have a direct experience of our own animal nature, yeah? It's like really important. I, it actually had a huge effect on me when I first saw that, yeah? It was a sense of relief somehow, for me at least, yeah? It just says it how it is, yeah? I thought, I'm a beast. That's true, yeah? We're all kind of nice people. We're kind of civilized most of the time here, yeah? But we're also beasts, yeah? We're animals. And that's actually, uh, that's actually how it is. And um, in a way, like Banti says, this, this realization to see yourself as you are, your animal nature, is, is the beginning of the spiritual life, which I found kind of interesting, yeah? Uh, it's where it begins, that kind of honesty. It's not like being yourself up, it's just being honest. Oh yeah, I'm, a, I'm an animal. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, a little, for me, a little side point about this animal nature is that I feel like you, you can only really trust someone who's aware of that side of themselves, yeah? I think if someone's not aware of their, their animal nature, it's very difficult to trust them. Have you ever met people like that? They're like, oh, they're so pure and friendly, and you're like... I mean, not to be unfriendly, but it's, they're just a bit like up here, and you think, oh, dear, something's... I don't want to be around this person if something goes sideways, because there's a lot underneath that they're not really aware of somehow, yeah? Um... Yeah, so we're just, yeah, that's the first look. You look in the mirror, and uh, he says, once you've recovered from the shock of seeing yourself as an animal, you have a second look, yeah? And then the second time you look, in a way, what you realize is, okay, you're an animal, but you also have this extraordinary thing, like a self-reflective consciousness, yeah? You're aware that you're aware, and you're aware of that. So you're aware that you're aware, and you're aware. And... Um, on dependence, in, you know, when you see that, then you can choose. There's a choice, yeah? And this is like the whole business of karma in Buddhism. So you do actually see that you have a self-reflective consciousness. And in every moment, there's a, a choice in front of you. Yeah? You can either act in a way that's going to take you down with these lot uh, who are naked and chained together into a miserable state, or you can act in another way, which will actually bear fruit in the sense of uplift and... Uh, a clear conscience, you might say, yeah? You, you, you start feeling good, yeah? There's a kind of sense of lightness and buoyancy through your actions, yeah? So that's super important. It's basically saying we have a, we have a, we have a kind of choice in each moment, yeah? Which is karma, yeah? So we can choose where to go. We can choose to evolve, yeah? You could say. So then the next step, um, what is the next step? Yeah, the next step, uh, if we choose to evolve, if that's something we're actually interested in and we don't just want to kind of allow ourselves to fall into all these miserable states or just go round and round in the wheel, what's the next step? So he says the next step, you can only take the next step if you know where you actually are now, yeah? Which is a big question. It's like, where are we, yeah? So he says, then you look into the mirror for a third time and you find out where you are, yeah? So you find out which realm you're in, yeah? Um, what do you see at any given moment? When you look into the mirror again and you see what realm we're in, what you're in, uh, you could be in any of these realms. Sometimes you look in the mirror, yeah, and you see a kind of happy face, like a friendly, happy face, kind heart, and you think, oh, I'm in the God realm, kind of, <laughs> yeah. Um, or you might look in the mirror and you're all like aggro, just like, think, oh my God, I'm in, I'm in the Titan realm, yeah? Like I've been battling with people all day, because I've got a bit of a frown sometimes. But anyway, you know what I mean? You, you look in the mirror and you see this kind of, mm, yeah, you're in that realm. Or you look in the mirror and you see this kind of famished, kind of <sighs> hollow face, yeah? Which you all, well, I imagine most of us experience at some point. You think, oh, right, I'm in, I'm in the realm of the hungry ghost at the moment. I want something that I'm not getting. And I feel, oh, yeah. Sometimes you look in the mirror and you see if, uh, you're in the hell realm, yeah? You, some, you're in extreme pain, whether it's physical or mental. You're in that realm, yeah? Sometimes you look in the mirror, maybe when you just got out of bed, and you're kind of in the animal realm, look. Yeah? <laughs> I don't know. He says, like, maybe you've even got whiskers and a snout and a tail. <laughs> and sometimes you look in the human realm. Uh, you look in the mirror and you see, oh, I feel I'm human today, yeah? I'm kind of... 
I'm not kind of up or down. I'm generally here and I'm present and I'm engaged with the world. You're in the human realm, yeah? Um, so he says, in a way, um, well, yeah, I mean, in a way, you, it, traditionally, you can take these realms literally, yeah? Uh, but you can also take them in a psychological sense. Uh, and the, the, like I was saying earlier, the thing about symbols, you, both can be real at the same time, yeah? They might exist on different planes or... So it might, be, it might be a literal place, or it might be uh, a psychological state, yeah? But for today, because I don't know about literal places, or maybe I do, but I'm just not aware of it, I think we'll, we'll look at it in terms of, like, um, how it relates to our present experience, yeah? Human, human existence, yeah? So we'll begin at the top. Uh, so, yeah, so Bhante says the God realm like we were saying earlier, represents um, like a happy state of mind. You know, you're, you're relaxed, you're content. Everything's kind of s one of those nice periods in life where everything's flowing smoothly. Those ones, yeah. <laughs> no obstacles, no difficulties at that moment, no problems, yeah. He also says it could be a state of uh, aesthetic pleasure. Like you go to a gallery, you listen to some music, and you're in a sense of like uplift, yeah. Uh, artistic enjoyment. Uh, he also says it, it, it could be a state of uh, meditation, yeah? Not in the transcendental sense, but in the sense of maybe higher states of consciousness, some kind of bliss, yeah? Uh, so that's the God world. Mm, he, then there's the Titan realm, yeah? So the Titan realm, uh, we were say, as we were saying earlier, is kind of uh, a state of aggressive competition, you could say, yeah? Uh, lots of energy, yeah? Lots of maybe success, sexual partners, um, but it's all turned outwards, yeah? So you've got all this energy that's kind of turned outwards. Yeah, there's a kind of restlessness to it as well. Um, maybe suspicion, jealousy, yeah? Because the gods are fighting for the wish-fulfilling tree. The, 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 the titans are fighting for the wish-fulfilling tree, yeah? So yeah, you could say it's about this endless, an endless drive for material possessions, wealth, status, um, higher and higher standards of living, which is good, but he calls it assertive egotism, yeah? So you're trying to be better than others, superior to others, control others, dominate, yeah? So that's the God realm. Hungry ghosts underneath these lot with the big bellies and big eyes and little mouths. I just wrote iPhone. So that's <laughs> kind of a slight bit like a sort of neurotic desire, yeah? So in a way you're seeking from the object more than that object can actually give you, yeah? Um, or maybe even you're seeking, which is interesting, makes the point, you're seeking something quite different from what the object actually is, yeah? The object will never be able to give you what you want it to give you, yeah? So um, it's kind of neurotic craving, yeah? Which we all know, know about. Uh, it's funny, we live near Hasenheide and I was walking here when I first got here, having my little mindful Buddhist walk, you know, just slowly walking. Actually, I, I think I tried it a bit without shoes on, yeah? I was like, having my little mindful walk. And I ended up in the cruising area, yeah? and I was just like walking around. And I was like looking in the bush, I was literally like looking at the trees. And like this dude came out of a bush, zipping his pants up, and the next guy came out, and they both like, ah! I was like, oh my God! Like, I mean, you know what I mean? It was just like, they were not satisfied. And uh, I thought, man, you just finished. And he's like already going again, so I thought it's a bit like us, you know, we just sort of, well, we all do that. We don't do that, well, who knows. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's kind of, Banti makes a funny point about sexual relationships as well. He says, it sometimes appears like one hungry ghost trying to devour another. I was like, Jesus, that's pretty good. Anyway, so that's, that's, the, that's the hungry ghost. The hell beings, um, yeah. You could say it's acute mental suffering, yeah, breakdown, insanity. Um, he also says, it, you know, the hell realm can be a realm where you've had like a long continued frustration of like natural human impulses, yeah. Could be sudden bereavements, um, unconscious internal conflicts that add up to suffering, or it could be physical pain, yeah. So that's the hell, hell realm. Um, animal realm, well... The animal realm is, is kind of one of sensual indulgence, yeah? So food, sex, and sleep, uh, which is nice, convenience. And in a way, he says, uh, when you're satisfied with all these things in the animal realm, you're quite tame, yeah? 
but when you're not, you're a bit like a wild animal and you go kind of nuts, yeah? Um, so I don't mean to be down on this, but it's, I think it's quite a good, it's quite important to reflect on that because sometimes we think we're really good people, but most of the time, if I'm honest, I'm kind of nice when things are going well. When, when, when my kind of animal needs are satisfied, I'm generally a nice animal. And when my animal needs are not satisfied, I'm quite a nasty animal. Um, so I thought, you know, to be a, a good person, like a truly good person, it's hard work, really hard work, yeah? Um, yeah, oh dear, shall I say that? Oh God, why not? Anyway, um, so I was reflecting on the animal realm in my own experience. And when I was younger, I watched a substantial amount of pornography, yeah? And um, especially my teenage years. And I, I was very glad that I wasn't born in the realm of the internet because I'd have think I'd have been destroyed, you know? So I was spared internet porn because it's like a total madness, yeah? Uh, it's really messing up a lot of kids. Anyway, I won't go into that, but... It's nature's way, isn't it? Especially when you're a teenager, you're just like supercharged, yeah? But anyway, I remember watching this interview with, with this porn star, whatever that means anyway, watching this porn star on one of these videos. And I won't repeat what he said, yeah? But he was saying that he liked his job. And he's like, it completely killed the vibe for me, yeah? It really put me off. Uh, his face, he was just like, yeah, I like to. Uh. I was like, oh my God. And it was weird, it was years later, and I was living in this kind of semi-monastic community called Padmaloka, and there's all these farms nearby with these kind of, well, loads of cows, and sometimes the bulls would jump on the cows, and, and I'm just looking in their faces, and I thought it was exactly the same face. It's like literally the same, this kind of like, uh, this dull kind of animal face. And I was like, yeah, we do get into the animal, animal realm sometimes, you know. Um, anyway. There we go, that's the animal realm. Human realm, um, yeah, you're not, you're not particularly in the God realm or hell realm. Uh, you're just self-aware, yeah? You're self-aware, uh, you're aware of other people, uh, your needs are satisfied, yeah? And we can kind of devote ourselves to something else, which we'll get into. So we had the world of the gods, which is higher aesthetic pleasure, yeah? Uh, the titan realm, maybe you could call it, I don't know. Politics, like big business, nasty business, hungry ghosts, yeah, uh, iPhones, new, neurotic craving, tormented beings, and then uh, hell and the human realm. So there we go. Um, so we see our animal nature, yeah, first time we look. Then we realize we have a self reflective consciousness. We can choose, we can make good choices going up or bad choices going down, yeah. Then we get a sense of where we actually are to make a choice, yeah. Uh, but then it's like, well, how do you know where to go then? Once you kind of get a, got a sense of where you actually are, how do you know where to go? And uh, Bhante says, you need to look at the Buddha in each realm. There's a different Buddha in each realm, yeah? So uh, in the God realm, yeah, there's this, this uh, Snow White Buddha playing a veena, playing a, a lute, yeah? And he's playing the music of impermanence, yeah? So he's saying, in a way, when you're in that state, which is a very nice state to be in, where everything's going perfectly for you for a prolonged period of time, the next step is to remind oneself that it doesn't last, not in a gloomy way, but just to be conscious of that. It's a kind of sobering, yeah? You don't get completely lifted off in your own, you're aware, oh, this is really pleasant, but it's not gonna last, yeah? Um, <laughs> Bhante actually says prolonged, I mean, yeah, it'd be nice to have it, but Bhante says prolonged happiness can be spiritually dangerous, if not disastrous. <laughs> So what he means is, if we're happy all the time, yeah, if things are easy all the time, uh, no problems arise, no obstacles, uh, what happens? Yeah, we become, he says, we become self-satisfied generally, we become careless sometimes, unmindful, um, yeah. And he said, in a way, this can apply to meditation itself. I mean, it'd be nice to have this problem, I have to say, but uh, it can apply to meditation itself where you're in bliss all the time and you kind of settle there. And it sort of relates to the Buddha's own journey. You know, the Buddha really, along the journey, before the Buddha became the Buddha, he, he said to really mastered meditation. He was in very high states of consciousness, bliss, like a god realm. And he realized that that wasn't the end of the journey. Yeah, he could still fall back. It wasn't a kind of transcendent state. It wasn't wisdom. It wasn't the final, uh, final stopping point, yeah? So, um, yeah, so he plays the melody of impermanence. And... 
I thought it was interesting. Sangha actually makes the point. He doesn't lecture. The, you can't go to the God realm and lecture people. You know, it just doesn't work. You, 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 don't, oh, you know, there's people are suffering. It's like, yeah, yeah. You know, it doesn't really work. You have to kind of tune in. So, um, yeah, it's a kind of beautiful music that kind of brings them out into a state of getting a sense of where they actually are. Yeah, and music can do that, can't it? Uh, yeah, I was, I was at the opera with Dharma Sara, who's away on this ordination course. And when he took me to see uh, Tristan and Isolde, yeah? And it was extraordinary. It was like the last two minutes of that opera. It was, you could almost see people coming off their seats. It was like you'd have four hours of drama and stuff. But it was almost all for that last two minutes where it just lifted, well, lifted me. And actually, I could see others into a completely different state. And it wasn't just pleasurable there was a kind of awareness to it as well and I just thought wow that is genius that is really people could barely talk to each other afterwards it was like you know the kind of so it's possible yeah hmm good um so then the titan realm yeah you have this green buddha with a sword and he carries the the sword of wisdom so what does that mean it means um if you're in a state of fierce competition yeah a state of competit competitiveness and aggression. In a way, Banti says the next step is to develop what you might even call intellectual insight, yeah, on that level, but wisdom, yeah. You're really trying to look at what are you actually trying to achieve, yeah. All this energy and effort going into this thing that you're fighting for, is this actually what you want? Is, is it worth it, yeah? Is, it, is, it, is all this energy, when you really dissect it with wisdom, where is it leading, yeah? And is it the best possible use of all this energy and effort that you're putting in, yeah? So an insight into, into reality, yeah? I mean, he makes another interesting point, which he's, and he says uh, aggression, yeah? And even hatred, um, because these, these anti-gods, yeah, these titans, they're dominated by hatred. He says hatred does have an affinity for wisdom. Yeah, it is linked. So hatred, uh, in Buddhism at least, is, is, is linked to wisdom, yeah? Um, he kind of comically says, if, there's lot, if you've got a lot of hate in you, don't worry, maybe you're closer to wisdom, yeah? Um, so it's a kind of, um, yeah, I mean, what's it like when you're in a state of hatred, you want to destroy something, don't you? Um, if you hate someone, you just want that person or that thing gone. Yeah? You, Bante says, you just want to make one great big nothing of where they were before. Yeah? If you really hate someone, you want them gone. Uh, you want to destroy them, but uh, wisdom is there's a similar energy or something with wisdom wisdom you want to destroy ignorance yeah there's something between you and a higher state that you know is there you've got this instinct for it and that aggression and hatred is turned towards that yeah so you're you're destroying your ignorance yeah your, your kind of foolishness it gets destroyed yeah so in Buddhism that's sometimes also symbolized by a thunderbolt yeah a vajra yeah, which destroys obstacles. So hatred and wisdom are linked. Yeah, one is one. Hatred is obviously highly unskillful, but wisdom is is skillful. Yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah, the hungry ghosts. Uh, in the hungry ghost realm, you've got this red Buddha. Yeah, and this red Buddha is offering them food and drink they can actually eat. Yeah. Um, so I thought, in a way, he's saying what you, 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 we need to look at what we're actually trying to eat. Yeah. Uh, what we're what we're l craving for is it actually going to work? Is it going to satisfy us? Yeah. Um, I thought it's especially important in this day and age in the kind of digital social media world. Like we were talking about it on the way here. You know what you're trying to consume on that in that world is it no is it actually going to nourish you? Is it going to kind of is it going to give what give you what you really need? You know, is it is it edible? Is it real food? Um, so in a certain sense, in that realm. You, you kind of need to see whether the, the kind of desired object is actually able to give you what you actually want, yeah? And also know what it's not able to give you, yeah? Um, is it able to give pro proper satisfaction, yeah? Mm. That process in itself is a sort of wisdom. It does lighten your load. It kind of takes all that um, pulling off you, yeah? So, uh, in the hell realm, 
Uh, and the tormented beings, with the tormented beings, uh, you have a smoke-coloured Buddha, and he's giving them what's called amrita, which is uh, like an immortal nectar, yeah, a nectar of sorts. And um, it's interesting because amrita is not just nectar; it's actually apparently another a word that that can be used for enlightenment. Yeah. So that's interesting. Yeah, it's these, it's got a kind of double meaning. It's kind of um, it's a nectar, but it's also enlightenment itself. And Bhante says one of, you know, um, the nectar element is great and the enlightenment element, the other element is more profound. Yeah. So I think what that means, what he's saying is in, in, in one way, when you're in, a, when you're in a state of extreme suffering, um, you just want it to stop. You, know, you, want, you just want it to stop. Um, but the other way out of that extreme suffering is said to be enlightenment itself. There's a, and when you're in extreme suffering, there's much more, you've got much more interest in transcending suffering, not just putting a plaster on it, but actually transcending it, yeah? Um, I was saying in our course the other day, sorry to repeat myself, but the, 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 I think the most obvious example for me was, uh, I had this operation about five years ago, like a lower bowel operation, and the surgeon, just as I was sitting there in my socks and my gown and everything, he came in and said, oh yeah, just to say, um, it's probably one of the most painful operations you can have. And I was like, <laughs> okay. And then he left. Uh, and he was right. It was extreme. And I mean, it was in, I had the operation in Britain. And they have like, you know, how you have this kind of British understatement. So in the pre-op package, it says, you might be in a bit of discomfort for a week or so. I was like, oh, that sounds good. That's fine. I was in bed for three weeks, like, st- it was absolute agony. Like, uh, I went on this forum, and there was this woman saying, I've given birth to three children, and every time you go to the toilet, it's more painful than giving birth, yeah? Uh, and I was just like, oh, no. And it lasted for, like, a month for her, yeah? And so I, it was, like, the most extreme... I was, it was basically like hell. I couldn't meditate, I couldn't get out of bed. My mental state's completely degenerated, Yeah. Um, luckily, I was surrounded by friends. They were very caring. That was amazing. And also, I, um, the point is, I couldn't really take painkillers, yeah, because it, it gives you. Well, I'll go into it. You can't take painkillers, yeah. Um, so you, I was just left with this suffering, and I just so desperately wanted the painkiller, something that I could take, some morphine, anything, just to stop this thing, yeah. And uh, there wasn't. It wasn't possible. Um, so I thought I was going mad. Yeah, I couldn't sleep. Three in the morning, I ended up on, on my phone looking at um, an interview with a woman called Vidya Mala, who just got a, what's it, an MBE or OBE or something, some British honorary thing. Anyway, she's an extraordinary person, I think, actually. She, she, she shattered her back when she was young. You know, she's really in a lot of pain, and she completely in kind of, I don't know, she's got so much dignity, and... She knows how to work with pain. And she was just saying, in a way, the worst thing you can do is run away from it. Yeah? You, can't, um, you need to look at what's actually going on and uh, watch out for your mind because the mind is producing all this suffering. It brings you into hell realm. Your mind is just like creating all these stories. You've got this, this sensation and then the mind is creating all these stories on top of it. Oh, I'm going to have to wear nappies for the rest of my life. I can't get out of bed. Uh, you know, you, and it's like, that's the suffering. And it was really strange. I really put it into practice. And one day I was in the, sh- I'm go, anyway, I was having a shower after, and I was, I was actually sobbing. It's kind of embarrassing, not embarrassing. It's just how I was in so much pain. I was sobbing in the shower. And then I remember what she said. And I was like, oh, it's just sensation. And I went to the pain and took the labels off it. And it was just like really <laughs> intense sensation. But I ended up in this super, like a state of bliss as well. It was so confusing. I was like, you know, this time I actually had a light coming out of my forehead. I was like, what? <laughs> and that completely blew me away. I was like, oh, right. There's a way. So in a way, that seems to me to point towards that second thing of the Buddha offering um, something more than just cessation of pain. Yeah, offering a, a way, a completely different mode of being. Unfortunately, that skill has not stayed with me. <laughs> that would have been brilliant, but it's not. Um, but it's there, yeah. Okay. At least it gave me confidence that ah, it's possible to to. It's possible, yeah. So, 
the animal realm. In the animal realm, uh, you have a blue Buddha and he's offering a book, yeah? So in a way, it's basically when we're in a state of savage, savagery, yeah, you could say, um, you want to kind of refine yourself a bit. I don't mean like fine arts, maybe fine arts, yes, but you want you want to kind of, um, yeah, you want to refine yourself. I, for example, I was in London last week with my dad and he took me to a really fantastic concert at the Royal Festival Hall, you know, Philharmonia, and it was amazing. It was one of the most amazing bits of music I've ever heard, yeah? It was atonal, or with normally those atonal pieces, I'm like, oh my God, it's just <laughs> all over the place, yeah? It wasn't, but this was just like, Phew. and I have to say, before I got to that concert, I was in a bit of a kind of animalistic state, you could say, Ugh, food, and uh, I was, my mental state had degenerated a bit, if I'm honest, and getting annoyed with people in London on the street, Ugh. and I got there, and it really, you know, I would say that was like um, a refinement. It drew me up, and I felt very different by the time I'd left, yeah? So, um, yeah, the Buddha in that realm, this blue Buddha is offering some kind of culture, yeah? Um, some refinement. And in the human realm, if we move on, uh, the Buddha there is offering what you could say is a spiritual life, yeah? He's offering, he's saying, if, the Buddha is saying, if, you're, if you are in a human state, yeah, you're not an abject suffering, you're not having to deal with that and get yourself out of that somehow, you're not kind of completely neurotic about things, yeah? You, you're not dealing with that, you're not highly aggressive and like competitive trying to conquer everything, yeah? And you're not off in some kind of state of bliss somewhere. If you're in a human state, then the next step, in a way, is to take your potential seriously, yeah? Take your... Uh, what well, you might call your, your spiritual life seriously, yeah? Um, that could become your main interest, yeah? Um, so that's kind of an important thread to keep in mind. I won't go in, oh, well, <laughs> I don't have time, but we won't go into the outer ring. The outer ring is basically shows you how all this came about, yeah? Why, why, this, why all of this is actually going on in the first place, yeah? And how you can also, it shows you how you can get off the wheel, yeah? So, um, in a way, this circular motion, you're just going round and round and round, yeah? You could call it samsara. Maybe some of you heard that word samsara, yeah? Samsara means, kind of literally means the going around of things. It's just like you do the same thing year after year, decade after decade, getting older, doing the same thing, samsara, yeah? And it doesn't, apparently in Buddhism, it doesn't even finish when you're dead, yeah? You die and then you come back and do it all over again. So it's not like a, so that's samsara, the going around of things, and this kind of shows you how it's all turning, yeah? But the kind of key point to this image, in a way, is um, the tiny Buddha on the top right, yeah? Um, I found it quite interesting that apparently, I think in some of the uh, old Chinese wheels of life, you had the Buddha in the middle, yeah? Superimposed over the three poisons, yeah? Sort of saying, if you really look into the nature of existence, really look, you're not just left with the wheel. You're not just left with the round and the suffering and, ooh, and all this sort of stuff, yeah? If you really look into the wheel, what you'll find is something else, yeah? I think in Zen, I mean, Banti says something like, they call it your, your original face, yeah? Your, your kind of original face. You see other traditions call it your Buddha nature, yeah? You, if you actually go through this and you're honest about all this and you penetrate through all of this stuff, you see something else, which is essentially your own Buddha nature, something more, yeah? Uh, which is certainly why I carried on practicing Buddhism. Yeah? You just get an intimation, you get a sense, and you're like, oh, this is for real. There is actually more to me than just this endless circular existence. Yeah? It, you're not condemned to the wheel. Yeah? So the Buddha up here, he kind of, uh, well, you could say he represents Buddhahood in its essence, outside of time and space, yeah? outside of the wheel in itself, yeah? enlightenment. But he's also pointing to this uh, moon with a, rabbit, well not rabbit, a hair in it, which represents um, the Bodhisattva, which is essentially the path, yeah? He's pointing to the Bodhisattva interacts with the wheel, yeah? He's, he or she is in the wheel, the Bodhisattva is in the wheel, like we're in the wheel, only they're working towards enlightenment, not just for their own benefit, but the benefit of uh, everyone, yeah? So it's a kind of very altruistic... Um, commitment to attaining enlightenment, not just for yourself to escape, but for all beings, yeah? So that's super important. You know, you look into the nature of the wheel and you think, oh, that looks a bit miserable, uh, it's a bit difficult. But in a way, there's, 
uh, Buddhism saying there is a, there's, a, there's an option, yeah? you're not condemned uh, to that. Yeah? Mm. yeah, that's it. Good. So uh, we have, unfortunately, not long. I, w- I, would have, I was trying to aim for a short talk, but that was stu- I mean, I, re- I printed this out and there's like 20 pages, I thought. Oh dear, that's, but we have five minutes for any questions or anything, so if you have any questions or clarifications or anything, now's the time. Yeah. I didn't really understand your question. Okay, you mean so you've got the three animals in the big, and, and then the second wheel. Yeah. I think the second wheel is um, referring to karma, really, it, or maybe even fruits of karma. Mm-hmm. So, uh, uh, in one segment, you have like happy looking beings, well, yeah, going up more probably towards the, the God realm. And in the second realm, uh, second uh, section, you have these naked, chained beings together falling down into the hell realm. And, I mean, in a sense, I, it seems to be, uh, yeah, it seems to be something to do with karma. Yeah, the fruit of karma, perhaps. Mm-hmm. You know, like you have a choice, you're not just an animal. There's, there's, when you bring awareness to it, you're, well, we were looking at karma a few weeks ago, as your, your, your actions will have consequences, and they'll either take you somewhere good, or they'll take you somewhere bad depending on your every decision in your day. Yeah, it has fruits. Mm-hmm. I think that's... So I'm sure that the wheel is turning, so I mean, you can do unskillful, uh, make unskillful actions and go down, but it's possible. It's not to sort of just sink to the bottom and that's it. Yeah. You can make skillful actions and come back up again. So yeah, that's a good point. I mean, it's like with the rest of Buddhism, uh, it, everything's impermanent. So if you find yourself in a hell realm, yeah, it's a good point. It's worth remembering. It's impermanent. The same as the God realm. You're in a God realm. You're ah, it's somewhere and you have it. It's impermanent. Yeah, it's just, but it's a, yeah, it's a cyclical. The wheel is cyclical. Did you have a question? Yes, yeah. I don't know what is the meaning of the monster of Ah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, uh, yeah, the monster, well, represents impermanence. A bit like we were saying, so everything's impermanent. And um, that's the kind of... And I remember reading somewhere, the, this uh, uh, monster has a third eye, which you could say represents an element of kind of awareness into that truth as well, uh, of, of, of insight. So uh, in a way, if you could really see that everything's impermanent with that, um, with that insight, it would be a liberating thing. It's not a kind of oh no, everything's impermanent, I'm going to get old and die. And It's more like, oh, you really see, it has a, a, a freeing effect. It's said to have a freeing effect. When you really see that things are impermanent, your whole behavior changes. And those five skulls, I think they represent um, the five um, uh, different aspects that, that um, c- uh, construct us, you could say. You know, body, feeling, consciousness, um, perception... Uh, other stuff, one more. <laughs> huh? volition. volition, yeah, your conscious decisions, your volition, yeah. So uh, it's sort of a really, it's sort of having a look at, well, I guess this is us, we're impermanent, and really seeing how we're made up. We're made up of all these different aspects of thought and physicality and emotion, and you really see the impermanence of it. Um, and it's, it's important to stress it's not a kind of negative experience. It's not a kind of experience of oppression or, yeah. yeah. This five skulls, five aspects, yeah. this, what it's called, the shikanda? Yeah, 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 yeah. Out of those six skulls, is there any one, is any one of them better or worse ah, yeah. suited for um, practice for yeah. karma or for reaching enlightenment? Oh, that was a key point. I forgot that. Great. So, so your point is, is, is any of these six realms actually the best realm to be in? Yeah, very good point. Um, I mean, you would assume, or maybe not, but you would assume it would be the God realm, 
because that's where we're all trying to go, aren't we? We're all trying to get into the God realm where everything's nice all the time and ice creams and I don't know, whatever. Yeah, we're trying to get into the God realm, which is sort of what we're trying to do as a society as well. Which we're having a good attempt, yeah? I mean, like, you know, you press a button and the car turns up and you get in it and it takes you where you want to go and you press a button and your toothbrush turns up probably within an hour, you know? It's kind of like the God realm, yeah? Um, but apparently that's one of the worst realms to practice in, in a certain sense, because you're just sort of, as, I won't make it comical, you're not a vegetable, but you're kind of like, you're just sort of wandering about, yeah? Sort of happy. And actually the best realm uh, to, to, to practice in is the human realm, which is interesting. So, yeah, so that's interesting. You've got the God realm that most of us are aiming for, but actually, the, according to Buddhism, the place where you're most likely to make progress and be happy at a much deeper level, more profound level, is the human realm, which I found I found it a bit disappointing when I first came along. I was a bit like, yeah, but human, like, it's a bit boring, you know what I mean? Like, it's just me and my boring body and people and like <laughs> problems with people and like work and but no, Buddhism is saying the human realm is in a way the most profound realm somehow. And we, it's, when, you, when you take that on board, it sort of gives your own life a slightly different, different meaning. Um, so yeah, the human realm is the, most, is the best realm to be in. Funnily enough, the hell realm is not a good place to be, but in terms of motivation to practice, it's said to be actually, uh, well, if you're there, you have a lot of reason to you're very, very focused on what suffering, how suffering arises and how you actually finally stop it. Yeah. You have a, yeah. I was just thinking, um, well, I mean, the human realm is the realm where you can gain enlightenment, actually. Yeah. It's like, I mean, we all made it to the human realm, basically. Yeah. Means we can actually gain enlightenment, it's quite... Yeah. And you can actually really receive the Dharma and live a spiritual life. Yeah. It's quite significant. Yeah. Like it's really yeah. Yeah, and that's what the Buddha's sort of pointing out in that realm. Uh, yeah. Why is there so much obsession with jhanic states and with the super deep godlike meditation states? <laughs> Why is there so much obsession with godlike yeah, super it's conscious about states? About it. Yeah. It seem to be that conducive. Yeah, it's a bit, I know, it's a bit of a complex. It is super important. Um, I think in a way, it seems like with most of these other realms, they're, they're kind of, um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> thank you very much, Kirill. <laughs> I've got like no time. <laughs> but, I mean, and obviously, uh, these super conscious states, they're not only blissful, but they're like super important to practice, to develop a kind of mind that is... Uh, powerful enough and robust enough and positive enough to be malleable, you know, to, to really look into the nature of existence. Uh, so th it's really, really important. And also it's, it's super pleasurable in a very positive, skillful state. So you act in a good way. You are, you're, you're satisfied. You've got enough bliss and pleasure going on that you're not getting into all kind of madness with other people and getting tangled up into all other problems. You can actually... So on that level, uh, I think it's really important it's a good point, though, with the God realm. I always found that a bit confusing. I was like, hang on a minute. They, are, they, are they just in the God realm, like, having a lot of pleasure? Or are they also meditating, like, and having profound mental states? Um, it's a bit of a grey area. I think it also relates to the Buddha's journey itself, because maybe... I wish, I'd ha I wish I had this problem, but maybe if you're in a state of bliss all the time in meditation, you c apparently you can just stay there. But you might not be... You, it's said that you're... Your, uh, it can run out if you're not careful. You can just run on the fruits of previous actions. And all, it's, it's a bit like practice itself, yeah? I've done that myself, like an idiot, many times where I've been doing loads of practice, acting really ethically, meditating, trying to be a good person, you know, and I haven't even noticed that I'm experiencing the fruits of that. And so I, I just forget that I'm in a good positive state, I'm being nice, I'm happy, and I stop practicing. And I just, yeah, like I'm surfing. And then, and I've crashed. I'm like, oh, what happened? Well, the fruit ran out. And it was the end. It took three months, but, which is a good go, or two days, or one day, but it ran out. So it's time to work again. 
So that's why you can end up in a kind of God realm and just slide all the way down into a, actually a hell realm. Yeah. Uh, Oh, yeah. It gets away from the real point of wisdom mm. on meditation. Very good, yeah. And they just stay in this state of mind, yeah. but they don't see anything around them. Yeah. So that's why getting to this state is not possible because they are just avoiding reality. Yeah. So this is like a way to run away from what they are trying to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're saying, so you're saying in the way people can use meditation to escape, to avoid reality exactly. and yeah, escape. Like yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, no doubt. That said, I think it would be really nice if we could meditate <laughs> a real depth to have the problem to then go, do you know what, I'm avoiding my... Exp- I, but your point is definitely it's the same point that Buddha's making in a way. You know, you can kind of get a bit lost in a, in a kind of realm of experience, which is not actually taking you somewhere good in the end. But let's, let's all try and... Yeah. You've got as much uh, things uh, you want to keep you happy. Yeah. You can go on your yacht, you can go to yeah, yeah. island, yeah, yeah. you can go on your holidays. Yeah. And uh, what more can you want? Yeah. Great. Yeah, so you could take it in two ways. I think that's the whole point with a, with a symbol, isn't it? You can take it in many ways. You can take it in terms of privilege and material possessions. You know, you could, you could be like, I don't know, Mark Zuckerberg or I don't know what. I don't want to comment on how people are actually, but... You could be like in a privileged position and just have a life of ease, although I'm not sure it is really a life of ease, to be honest, but you could see it like that or you could see it in meditative terms, couldn't you? Yeah. 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 You could do that. Yeah. Great. Well, there you go. Maybe in your next life, that'll be you. You'll be... (laughs) Yeah. There you go. I'm I'm run way over time, I'm afraid, so uh, I have to wrap it up here.